This episode is brought to you by Naval and his legendary quote, be impatient with action and patient with results. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. ¿Cómo están, ladies and gentlemen? Qué gusto estar aquí con ustedes. Very excited to be with you here all again. Part two of the Productivity Machine Workshop. How to free up a thousand plus hours for what matters. Thank you for listening to part one. If you haven't listened to part one, go and listen to part one because it's going to be instrumental for you to be able to understand the second part of it. My name is... Stefan Dyer, welcome to the Stefan Dyer, where we host remarkable people for amazingly vulnerable conversations. And this episode with myself, <laughs> this in between episode, as Tim Ferriss would say, is part two of something that I created after years of researching ways on how to save time, free up time for what matters, be more productive at what I am, at what I do. And find out ways to become a better comedian, better father, better husband, better everything. I just hate waiting. I hate doing stuff not efficiently. So over the course of five years since I quit my full-time banking job in 2017, I read hundreds of books, articles, listened to thousands of podcasts, and developed this three-hour productivity machine workshop that I teach usually on a monthly basis. Mostly around Christmas time because everybody wants to do uh, New Year's resolutions. And I just decided to give it away. Like Red Hot Chili Peppers, give it away, give it away. <laughs> so, thank you for being here again. Thank you for listening to part one. I know that it might have seemed a little uh, slow at times because there's a lot of concepts. But it's critical that you listen to it because those pillars are super important. What is productivity? Yes, it's doing more in less time, but don't just think of time as the most precious unrenewable resource. Also think of attention, energy, and willpower as super, super precious finite resources, which you have to protect every day. So in simple words, pick the hardest things to do in the morning because that's when you have the most amount of energy, willpower, because by two o'clock, you're going to be tired and you're going to have depleted your units of energy and willpower. Think of it as a video game, like I said. You only get 100 units of willpower every day, and you have to use those 100 units of willpower to tackle your to-do list, the most important parts of your to-do list. So when we talk about to-do lists, you can't just have a general to-do list. You got to have a to-do list with priorities. And 1 to 5 are the most important. 6 to 10 are the second most important. And 11 to 15 are the third most important. And you're going to dedicate your most precious hours and high output hours, which is the morning because you're already rested, to tackling those top one to five items of your day, of your week. The two questions that I use, which I mentioned in part one, to really break down my priorities is the one thing question from the one thing book by Gary Keller. And it goes like this. If we were to, no, it's not if we were to meet it. That's my question from the podcast. So it goes like this. What's the one thing, what's the one thing I can do today such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary? And then you can add a fill in the blank after one thing, uh, after, uh, yeah. What's the one thing I can do today in my fitness life in my relationships with my dad, with my mom, in my, uh, in my spiritual journey, in my personal development, it, for my family, such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary. Most of the times that I ask myself that question, the answer is hire a coach or uh, hire an accountability, uh, get an accountability partner. Cause I, I just have to do it, but sometimes I'm not too motivated. So, and then the other question that really helps me identify my my top three priorities of the day is, would I be satisfied 
if I completed these tasks at the end of the day? And if the answer is no, then those are not your priorities. Like you got, you got to be satisfied. If these were the only three things I completed today, would I be satisfied? And if not, then change the three to- topics. Like Tim Ferriss says, the things that the things that hinder the goal are the goal. So you got to focus on those things that really, really, that you don't like. The task which hinders your task is your task. The task which hinders or obstructs your task is the task. Okay, so let's jump into it. Let's jump into it right away. I just wanted to do a little bit of a summary. Go, uh, yeah, go listen to it because there's too many things for me to summarize right now. So today, in part one, we looked at the pillars. What is productivity? Why do we? Why do you want to be more effective? The minimum effective dose. What's your hourly rate? The power and the the importance of mental clarity as a key ingredient for productivity, leverage, which is a force multiplier for whatever you're doing. You got to have leverage in whatever you're doing, ideally. And the general tips, plan your week, to-do lists, the one thing book question, multitasking versus chunking, the Pomodoro technique, the two minute rule, perfectionism, arrive early, mental minimalism, and start with why. But Today, we're going to jump into the weeds. So we're going to have morning tips, technology tips, nutrition and resting tips, and at work tips. And I'm going to give you a bunch of book, documentary, and podcast recommendations. Okay, here we go. Let me sip some water, ladies and gentlemen. In the meantime, add me on Instagram (laughs) at Stefan Dyer, shameless plug. Water, that's a huge productivity tip. Okay, here we go. Morning tips as the great number one morning tip as the great Tony Robbins would say motion creates emotion. What does that mean? That the reason why you can't wake up is because you can't wake up. You literally don't get up. The reason why you don't get up from bed in the morning. Some people say, oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, yeah, you're not a morning person because either you're going to bed super late or because you don't don't get up. And when you get up, it creates motion, which then creates emotion. So the tip here is play music as soon as you wake up or do push-ups or count down in your head or out loud from 5 to 1, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then you get up. That also helps. Or, or just do something that you love in the morning. Just have like know that you're going to get coffee or you're going to play an audiobook, or you're going to go running or you're going to play a podcast or even you're going to look at watch a Netflix series. Just get up. Anything that you look forward to. This is a extreme, extreme tip, but there is a app called Alarmy. How do you spell that? Like alarm, but with a Y in the end. And it's an alarm on your phone that you physically have to move for it to shut up. So you'll program it for for you to have to be doing like 10 10 jumping jacks or 20 jumping jacks until it shuts up. So you physically, literally have to get up and do something um, motion related so that the alarm shuts up. And then you're then, then you're super awake. You're awake already. And then you can start your day. So motion creates emotion. Tip number two for the mornings. No email for one hour. Stop looking at your email in the first 60 minutes of the day. of people wake up, grab their phone, and check their emails. By doing this, and just please listen to this because this is probably one of the most important things ever. By doing this, you let other people's needs and wants dictate your life. You will be at least 30% more productive with almost no effort. Just literally don't look at your phone for the first 60 minutes of the day. And this includes your email, WhatsApp, TikTok, Instagram, just Leave your phone away, like not next to your bed. And then you can't do that. Leave it on the other side of the room or turn it off and leave it in your in your office and have an ala- actual alarm clock next to it that is not like dig- it's not like a smartphone. So you just get up and then you can't you can't go on Instagram. You can't go on TikTok or Twitter or whatever. Why? Because being worried and consuming too much information, it clouds your brain. 
And remember that mental clarity is a key ingredient in your productivity. So tip number three for the morning, stop information consumption. Stop watching TV, news, Instagram, anything that triggers you. So uh, my wife loves Twitter, loves looking at the news on Twitter, reading it on Twitter. I just literally, I don't watch the news. And my philosophy, thanks to Tim Ferriss and, and the and the four-hour work week, I just literally stopped watching the news. I don't care about the news. I don't look at CNN. I don't do it because it, it makes me feel like I'm more worried than I actually have to be. I feel like the world is going to end. Yeah, I know. Like the Russia-Ukraine situation, it, it, it's horrible. I know there's horrible wars going on. I know that COVID is horrible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I don't need to worry more than I have to. So basically, I protect again my energy, my willpower, and my mental health so that I have the mental clarity to perform at, at my best. Because if I'm, I'm worried all the time, it's inefficient. Being unhappy and worried is inefficient. So my philosophy is if there's something super important, like somebody will tell me. My wife will tell me. Somebody's going to call me. So stop watching TV, the news. All these things just trigger you, make you more worried, make you more of an angry person. Tip number four, and I kind of just mentioned that, no cell phone in your room, no smartphone in your room. Have an alarm clock, but leave your cell phone out of your, out of your room when you sleep. Or leave it under the bed or so that you have to do push-ups and, and, and then get the phone from under the bed. Or so you have to do something physical. But leaving it, leaving your cell phone in the room or next to your bed, it's the worst thing ever. It's just bad for everything. Mostly because you're going to be on your cell phone before you sleep, which is not good for the mind because you need to be winding down. Uh, my friend, uh, the great Jose Carlos Gomez Bolaños, recommended this amazing book called Why We Sleep. And uh, spoiler alert, it helps you sleep. <laughs> but it basically says that you have to be winding down like two or three hours before you go to bed, before you actually sleep, and the mind needs to start to rest. So if you have the phone next to your pillow or your bed, you're going to be on your phone in the dark looking at it, and it's going to not help you sleep. When you look at this in the context of your partner, your significant other, it also messes everything up in terms of your intimate life, having sex, because I'm like, well, if I see my wife on her phone, then I'm going to go on my phone, and like one night is not the problem, but if you multiply this times 365 days, you're clearly going to be having less sex. Then people are going to be starting to make like, like believe stories or tell themselves stories that maybe your partner or your significant other doesn't want to have sex with you. She'd prefer the, the, the phone or whatever. And then it's just going to go downhill. It's just unwanted problems. And then in the morning, if you have your phone next to you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to wake up. You're going to grab the phone. You're going to go on Instagram or TikTok. And then like in a heartbeat, 33 minutes went by. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm in a hurry. And then everything else in the day is in a hurry. And guess what suffers when you're in a hurry? Everything. Because when, you, when you're in a hurry, you don't have mental clarity. When you're in a hurry, you multitask, which means that you're doing everything not good. And then you're just catching up, which is the antithesis antithesis of creativity and productivity. So just leave it out of the room. I have a thing where I, I turn my cell phone off at 10 p.m. until 9 a.m. And I just, just don't touch it. Sometimes I'll, I'll turn it on to play Spotify when I go and drop my son off at uh, daycare. Or if I, pl I play a podcast or music when I'm running. But... Apart from that, like the most important part to me is I don't open WhatsApp or my email because that's like a tsunami of people screaming at me. And again, you let other people's needs and wants dictate your life as opposed to doing the things that matter to you in that one hour from 7 to 8 a.m. or 6 to 7 a.m. Where you could do yoga or you could meditate or you could actually have a nice breakfast with your partner by yourself. Or that like two minutes where you have your coffee and it's like the most precious time for you. But if you're just running because you were on your phone on TikTok at six in the morning 
or on TikTok and Instagram on the toilet, as soon as you woke up and you went to pee or you went to poop, then you multiply that times 365 days and you just wasted like 150 hours of your year. Because you're probably going to go on Instagram and TikTok later in the day and see the same things. So suffice to say, motion creates emotion. No email for one hour as soon as you wake up. Stop information consumption and no cell phone in the room because, especially when you open WhatsApp and Instagram, you let other people's needs and wants dictate your life. Set, like, where do you draw the line? There, in the morning. That's your time for you. Pay yourself first. Okay, now we're going to go with technology tips. And the real question here is, ladies and gentlemen, are you addicted to your phone? So, me and my uh, growth coach, Blanca, we did a little bit of an exercise that we used to check every week when we had our coaching sessions. He used to coach me. And basically, if your daily screen time average is under four hours... Or four hours, you're okay. What does this mean? When you go on your iPhone and you go on settings, screen time, which is like the sixth item in settings, and then you go and do see all activity, and in see all activity, you press the week part, you see, you'll see the graph of how many hours you spend on your phone every day. And if the average is like four hours every day, that's okay. I mean, it's not ideal, but that's okay. Most of the people have like six hours, seven, nine hours a day. And that number doesn't, it doesn't tell the whole story. Because maybe the nine hour average or the seven hour average a day that you're on your phone, where you have the phone open or you're using it, maybe it's being, there's a bias because you're using, I don't know, 21 hours a week on Google Maps when you're driving. So that that doesn't that's not bad because it's not taking away your attention from what matters. It's actually helping you reduce time when you're on Google Maps to go to places easier. But anyways, maybe maybe uh, 16 hours is on Spotify. You listen to music as you work out, or when you're in the car. So so that number of how many hours a day you're on your phone doesn't tell the whole story. But like like in the Google Maps or the Spotify uh, example, but if it says 44 hours on Instagram and 52 hours on TikTok every week, then you have a problem because you're spending a billion hours a week on Instagram and TikTok, which ironically is probably making you more miserable. So check your iPhone and try to bring it down. Here's a challenge. Bring down your daily screen time average. If you can bring it down to three hours, or two, you are golden. You're living. You're being in the present. That is like respect. Four hours, you're okay. Usually I'm in like four hours, 350, 340. You're okay. So iPhone settings, screen time, daily activity. Uh, I mean, see all activity. And on the top left, it's like the, there's like a little button that says week. And on the Android, it's easier. You just go on settings and digital well-being. Second tip on technology, it's called zero notifications. This drives my, my wife crazy, but having notifications drives me crazy. So basically, I have zero notifications on my phone except calls. So I don't know if somebody messaged me on WhatsApp. I don't have the banners. I don't have the things when I unlock my phone that you'll see like the little things or like the things that come up on top of the phone. I, I don't have notifications. If somebody wants to contact me urgently, you have to call me. And even then, sometimes I'm on, do not, I'm on do not disturb because the task at hand is more important than whatever somebody wants to tell me. Well, you may be thinking, well, oh, what if it's an emergency? <laughs> or what my wife says, well, what if I message you on WhatsApp and you're not seeing it? I'm like, well, if it's an emergency, you got to call me. Otherwise, it has to wait. Because one time is not the problem. The problem is that you have like 37 million groups on WhatsApp. Your uncles and tias and tios in Latin America, they're sending you like, the tias group is sending you like uh, the Virgin Mary and, and prayers. And the group with the tios is sending you porn or your friends from back home or just send porn in, in the WhatsApp group. So it's just distracting you all the time. There's a stat that says that 20 minutes 
It takes 20 minutes of your brain to be able to refocus on the task at hand again after an interruption. So all I'm doing is I'm protecting my, again, my mental health, my productivity, my well-being, my energy, and my willpower by just protecting myself from all these interruptions every day. So I challenge you right now, literally, remove all notifications from your cell phone. This is like just it's so easy. Okay, you go on your cell phone and you go on settings. Then you go on notifications if it's a iPhone. But it's easy on, on, on the Android as well. And remove all notifications, which means that in the little icon, it's not going to give you a 1 or a 3 or a 15 if you have 15 notifications or 15 people calling you, messaging you on WhatsApp. It just won't have the little red thing on top. And you won't get any banners when the phone is locked. And you won't get any interruptions if you're doing something else. It's also disrespectful when you're having coffee with somebody and you have your phone on the table and you're getting all these notifications on your cell phone and you're just constantly looking down and the person's like, oh my God, do you have to go? And you're just like, no, 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 it's okay, keep talking. And I'm like, well, no, I don't want to keep talking because you keep looking at your cell phone. Or even worse, the people who have Apple Watches, I kind of want one, but I kind of don't want one. Where you're, you're talking to them, you're having coffee, you feel like you're connecting and they're just looking at their phone. They're looking at your phone. Because they got these, all they get all these notifications. So now you're thinking, oh, they're looking at the time because they want to go or they need to go, and then the and then the conversation just goes to shit. Because guess what? It's distracting everybody, and now it takes like two or three or twenty minutes to get back to that level of intensity and productivity of what the conversation was having before you look down at your watch or your phone. 19 times for the past two seconds so remove all notifications from your cell phone except calls because you do want to get the 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 ringtone when you get a call except google maps because you do want to get the notifications where you got to go with google maps and except with uber and uber eats because you do want to know when your uber is here and you do want to know when your uber eats is here but why do I need a no- notifications from like Scotiabank online? Why do I need notifications from like Spotify or like Rogers phones, like my cell phone bill? Who cares? Like a, a lot of these things are automated. Why do I need a, no- a notification from like my chess app on my phone? This is just you're like I'm dying one notification at a time. It's ridiculous. So. How do you remove them? On your iPhone, go to settings, notifications, and go into each app. And at the top, it says allow notifications. And you say no. And it'll literally just turn everything off. You have to go by each individual app to turn them off. Now, that challenge, do it right now. As you're doing it, I'm going to double challenge you to the next one. And I'm going to challenge you to delete apps. Delete all your apps, all the apps you can, especially the social media one, the social media ones. Delete the apps that you're addicted to. So I already deleted Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And if I need to post, I'll do it more intentionally from the computer. Or if I want to post from my cell phone because I don't have my computer, guess how much, how long it takes to re-download an app. You know how long? Like 27 seconds. Literally. So if I want to post something because it's urgent and it can't wait, which is not like rarely the case, what I'll do is I'll I'll re-download it, I'll post, and then I'll delete it again. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to lose your account. It just means that it's not on your phone. The app is not on your phone. Now, what are the benefits of this? That if you delete it, You're going to allow yourself to not go on Facebook 27 times a day to see if anyone wrote to you or on TikTok or on Instagram or on WhatsApp or on Twitter. Like you're just like refreshing the app for no reason. And you're probably doing it like 27 times a day, even if it's 10 times a day. That's 3,650 times a, a year that you're doing it, and you're not staying for five seconds on Facebook. Sometimes you're staying for five, ten minutes. 
That means that just by deleting these apps, you're probably saving yourself 36,000 minutes. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, I'm going into my calculator right now. 36,000 minutes divided by 60. That means you're, uh, you're literally saving yourself just by deleting these social media apps. 600 hours a year divided by 24. That's like 24. You're, <laughs> what? You're saving yourself 25 days of shitty activity that's not adding anything to your life. But if it is urgent, you, you download it. It's okay. It's okay. You just download it. it. Takes you 27 seconds. You post and then you ghost, like my good friend Jose Piranian always says post and ghost. So you post and then you ghost. You're not in the app for a million hours looking at everybody else's perfect lives and feeling miserable about yours. So delete your social media apps. It's not forever because if you really need them, you read down on them. Or if you just want to have fun, then you download them and you have fun intentionally with no guilt. It's okay. But just having it there, it is just making you less present and more miserable, in my opinion. Next tip is turn off your phone at nights. I already said that. Don't touch your phone from 10 p.m. to 9 a.m. It's going to make a big difference. Just turn it off. Leave it in your, in your office, in another room, and connect it. So tomorrow morning it is fully charged and you actually, you're actually excited to see some stuff if you want to. But you took that time to be present, to be with your partner, to be with your kids, or to watch a movie. Because most, most of us are not even doing anything well. You're watching a movie or a game as you're on your cell phone. And like that's why people love to go to the movies because you're just at the movies. And... Going back to part one, it's not peace of mind, it's peace from mind. Like the best moments are when you're just doing the one thing that you're doing at that time. Next one is do not take your cell phone into the bathroom. The title of this whole thing is how to free up a thousand plus hours for what matters. Now, this bathroom one may just save you like hundreds of hours. So... I'll tell you information that you're not asking for. If I, like, I take two minutes to poop max, like I'm in and out for my entire life. But when I go into poop, I take 30 minutes if I'm with my cell phone, if I carry my cell phone. And I usually go like twice a day. So <laughs> do the math. That's 30 minutes per time I go into the bathroom, twice a day. That's one hour sitting on the toilet. That's 365 hours a year. 365 hours a year on the toilet just because I took it into the bathroom. And then you're like, oh, bro, I just don't have the time to go play soccer. I love it, bro. Or some people are like, oh, I want to be with my son, my, my kids more, but I don't have the time. I want to go to the gym, but I don't have the time. I want to I want to read a book but I don't have the time. I want to have coffee. I want to I want to see my friends but I don't have the time. Well, of course you don't have the time cuz you've been on the toilet on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter for almost 400 hours a year. 4 <laughs> 400 hours a year. That is like 20 days sitting on the toilet. How ridiculous is that? So, I don't need to repeat it. Don't take your cell phone into the bathroom. Next one, unsubscribe to all emails. You you constantly get all these emails and you end up buying, especially from the Gap or Banana Republic or whatever your Express, Nike, Adidas, whatever your favorite store is. And the, the problem is, yeah, it takes you two minutes to delete it. But again, it takes away from your attention. And it's stealing that attention and that willpower that is so precious that you need to protect at all costs. So anything that I get, I'm like, I unsubscribe. And the other thing that I do is if I'm going to a store and I'm buying something at Banana Republic and they're like, oh, can I get your email from them? I'm like, no, no, you can't because 
You're going to send me all these emails? No, no, no. It's just for the receipt. No, no. Just print the receipt. I, I don't need it. I, I don't I don't want it uh, online because then they they end up doing they end up adding me to these lists that I didn't want to. So unsubscribe. And the worst part is that you end up spending money that you didn't have a budget for because you get these emails and then they say like, oh, 30 percent discount for a limited time for just today. So then you end up going and you end up purchasing things that you didn't need. Because if you did need them, then you would have looked for them intentionally before this shitty email that you got. So, it's like my mom. She goes to the mall and she's like, ay, a ver que se me pega. <laughs> it's like, let's see what I can find at the mall. So you go to the mall and then you find stuff, of course, that you weren't looking for. And then you end up buying like things for occasions that never happened. As opposed to being minimalistic and intentional with your things and only having things that bring you joy now i don't mean like you just have to have like one pair of jeans and one pair of shoes for the rest of your life that's not what i'm saying all i'm saying is that when you do things intentionally it brings you more joy and you're grateful because you wanted them for a longer time and therefore once you get them it has a greater component of gratefulness because you did look for this it becomes a bit of a project, a bit of an adventure, almost like buying this thing as opposed to buying 300 things a year that you didn't even want in the first place. And then you end up donating them because your closet is full. And if it's full, it's taking away from your mental clarity, which then is horrible for productivity. So there you go. Unsubscribe to all emails. Maybe this should be a comedy bit. <laughs> okay. And that also ties into the how much is your hour worth from part one? What is your hourly rate? If my hourly rate is $250 and I'm spending 10 hours a year like reading emails that I don't need to, then I just threw $2,500 down the garbage, down the drain. Next tip, YouTube everything. Sometimes you don't need to hire anybody. There's tutorials for everything on YouTube. And if you really want to get granular and obsessed and picky with this you could get youtube premium which i think is like 12 dollars a month but it would save you <laughs> it would save you from watching maybe like 25 hours a year of youtube ads that you didn't want or need and for 144 dollars you could save 12 hours or, or 25 hours of youtube ads 30 hours that are taking uh your your attention away and your willpower Obviously, this is if you use YouTube a lot. So there you go. YouTube everything. Next one, nutrition and resting, my friend. This is another section, nutrition and resting. Sleep and rest is tip number one under this category. And stretch. Stretching, contrary to what people believe, it gives you energy. And it also improves your longevity in terms of not getting injured, in terms of flexibility, so sleep and rest because by resting and sleeping, obviously, it gives you mental clarity, which, as you know, is a key ingredient in productivity. Okay, next one, which I've done for the past year, and I love it, intermittent fasting. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, how do you call it? A uh, disclaimer, disclaimer, obviously. Check with your doctor prior to intermittent fasting. But I tried to fast, which means not eating, for 14 to 16 hours every day because when your body is not using its energy to digest the food that you're eating, it's using that energy to restore your body and recharge it. In other words, the quality of your sleep increases significantly if your body's not sleeping and digesting. And as a result, your performance throughout the day increases significantly. Also, by doing intermittent... The other thing that, that I realized, I took this uh, nutrition habits course with Clorofila Vida on Instagram. Her name is Carolina. She's in Barcelona. She's Colombian. And she explained to me... I'm going to paraphrase. I'm probably going to butcher them, but you get the point. So basically, breakfast... Or this ayuno means that you're breaking the fast. You're you're not fasting anymore. 
you, you were fasting throughout the night and now you're breaking that fast to have breakfast. Now, for those of us who are in North America or in the Americas and we, we grew up with American TV, we're used to seeing this whole thing of breakfast with orange juice and, and, and fried eggs or scrambled eggs, bacon and bread and butter. But according to Clorophila Vida and all these studies that we read and documentaries that we watched, which I thoroughly support, the like breakfast, the eggs and bacon type of thing and sausage and, and, and toast is an American invention that has been around for the, like the last 30 or 40 years. And it came, it came with the fast food revolution that I think started in, in, in the 70s or 80s, where prior to that, like breakfast used to be different. So I've stopped eating breakfast in the morning. I used to have like a lot, like eggs, bacon, bread, avocado, orange juice. And then I realized it's, I don't need it as much. So... By fasting 12 hours, 12, actually 12 hours is actually normal because if you go to bed at 12 and your last meal was at like 7 and you eat at 7, that's a, that's a 10 hour fast from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. That's a 12 hour fast. So 12 hours is, is not as amazing. If you can do 14 or 16 or even 18, that's amazing. So what I'll do is... I will have my first meal, like I'll have a, a milkshake with a, a lot of really good things, like for example, mango, spinach, chia, uh, vegetable milk, like uh, almond milk or oat milk, and a little bit of um, honey, and then at around 10 or 11, and then I'll have lunch at around 1 or 2. And I'll have my last meal at like 6 p.m. So basically, my entire daily intake of food is from like 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., which is a six-hour slot. And then I don't eat after 5 p.m. until 11 a.m. the next morning. And that is an 18-hour fast. So I'm sleeping better. I'm resting more, which means I'm having more mental clarity because I'm more rested. And that means that I can perform better. Now, the one thing that I wanted to kind of butcher and paraphrase and say it in my own way is that if you're interested in also losing weight, intermittent fasting has been really like highly recommended for losing weight. I don't understand like the, the fancy terms, but basically... You you have enough calories and food to be able to survive for 18 hours without eating food. So, obviously you can drink water throughout the day and drink a lot of water, which is another tip. But, it's basically like if, you, if you're fasting, the body will eat the fat that it needs from your body to survive. So, by, <laughs> by doing the intermittent fasting... In those 18 hours, maybe the, maybe the body needs something throughout those 18 hours that, that it's not getting food and it'll use its reserves of fat or food or whatever it's called to survive. And if it's eating away the fat, then it means that you're, you, you're losing weight and it's, it's good for you, especially if you're overweight and if you want to get more fit, if you want to be more ripped, I don't know. Try it, research it. I did, and it feels great. It, 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 I just love it. So intermittent fasting. I just want to take a couple minutes with that one. Tip number three in nutrition and resting, it is meditation. It gives you mental clarity. And contrary to what you may think, it's super simple. So the suggestion is download an app and use, it, it's called Calm which is the one I uh, actually know. Calm is very famous. It's really good. I use the one that is called Insight Timer. And then there's another one called Headspace. But there's many, many ones. And the cool thing is that there are guided meditations of like one minute, five minutes, 20 minutes. I do this thing called Transcendental Meditation, which is basically repeating a mantra in your head for many, t like many times. 
A mantra is a word that doesn't have a meaning. It's just a sound in your head. And it just allows you to meditate and be aware of your surroundings. And if you have any thoughts that um, don't allow you to focus on the breathing or the mantra, you just let the thoughts go and come back to the mantra. Typically, the recommendation under TM or Transcendental Meditation is to do 20 minutes in the morning. And when when uh, when you haven't ate anything, and this is not a coincidence that a lot of people who have who who are monks or who are in deeply spiritual paths, they do the most of their prayer under med, uh, under like in fasting. They don't like have like three burgers and then they go pray. Typically. They fast and some of the best prayers and meditation happens when you're fasting. Uh, I don't understand exactly why, but I know for a fact that if your body is not using its energy to digest, then it's using its energy to restore and connect with your own self and, and I guess to connect to your own spirituality. So there you go, meditation. And it helps with being creative as well because... Meditation gives you mental clarity, and mental clarity is a key ingredient in being productive and creative. So there you go. Tip number four, breathing. Train yourself to breathe better with the help of apps such as Breathe to Relax. And it's a two in the middle, Breathe to, as in the number two, Relax. Pranayama is another one. Breathing Zone and Relax, Stress and Anxiety Relief. I actually took a course with Fernando, a Peruvian guy in Germany. I took it online on Zoom. Me and my wife took this breathing course, and it really helped me breathe better, be better. Uh, I, I do these breathing exercises at night when I'm about to sleep. It, it helped my wife to be more present, to reduce her headaches. She had, like, really horrible headaches, and... Again, if you learn how to breathe, you can restore yourself. You, you, can, you can restore better. You can uh, sleep better, which means that you're going to be more rested and you're going to perform better. So his name is Fernando Hibaja. And his Instagram is F Hibaja. And Hibaja is J-I-B-A-J-A. F. Hibaja. Oh no, he changed it. It's awake. Dot F. Hibaja. So awake. Dot F. Hibaja. You can just ask me on my Instagram at Stefan Dyer, and I'll, I'll I'll point you to his to his Instagram. He'll do these courses. He's like a PhD, masters, and all these things. He's like he, this guy's like a running machine because of the way he can breathe. He doesn't run too much, but when he does, he is like so good at running long distances because he optimizes his performance through really efficient breathing. I don't, like I could, I could talk so much about breathing, but try it. You'd think that you know how to breathe because we're breathing as we do this, but we don't. We forget how to breathe. So there you go. This is one of my favorite ones. Naps, nutrition and resting. Tip number five, naps. Take, I mean, never take naps longer than 25 minutes. 10 to, 12, 10 to 25 minutes is the optimal nap. After that, you will feel groggy. What does groggy mean? It means like when you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, man, I'm not, I'm not rested. This nap was counterproductive. I feel shittier. I feel like <laughs> super lazy and my body just doesn't, I can't get into the task. But if your nap is 10 minutes or 25 or under that you're gonna be golden so there's this little thing called the nappuccino which is a uh, if some of you are very extreme and you drink coffee i don't i've uh since like 2017 i i have it i've had like six coffees but um i realized that when i was at the bank it was more of a social thing and then it started giving me tachycardia, like my my heart went my heartbeat went too fast, so I stopped drinking coffee. And but if you do, if you do, the nappuccino means 
if a double shot if a double shot or an espresso takes five minutes to kick in, you could take a nappuccino, which means you take the shot of espresso or a double shot right before your nap. And if it takes you four minutes to sleep or five, then you're sleeping by the time the caffeine kicks in. And if your nap is 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes, then you're going to wake up with the effect of the of the of the nappuccino and you're going to feel like ah like hulk i don't necessarily recommend this tip but i heard it on the tony robbins podcast with daniel pink called timing is everything i'll put it in the show notes cuz this was like this episode timing is everything was instrumental in all these tips and and in creating this workshop drink water uh, this is self-explanatory, but I really like this one. So listen to it. If you're angry, it's probably because you're hungry. And if you're hungry, it's probably because you're thirsty. So drink lots of water. Everything can be prevented with drinking lots of water. Almost everything. You know what I mean. So I'm going to drink water as I do this one. So here we go. Number seven and last tip of nutrition and resting. Close. This is a like a marginal tip, but if you add it up, it'll save you like 10 hours a, a year. The night before going to the gym, leave your gym clothes outside. In fact, you can leave all your weekly gym clothes outside already or work clothes for that matter. Pick it on Sundays. If you time how long it takes you to decide what to wear every day in the morning... And multiply it times 365 days a year, you're probably saving around 15 hours just by doing it at once the night before or on Sundays. If you know you're gonna go to the gym, I don't know, four times a week, just pick four shirts, four t shirts, four socks, and leave them in a specific area of your room. And now you just grab you just grab and go. As opposed to having decision fatigue and taking two minutes or five minutes to pick. You think it doesn't happen, but it happens. It happens to me. It happens to my wife. It happens to everybody. So, or if you think it, if you can think about it in the shower, sometimes it helps you do that as well. All right, my friends, here we go. Last section at work tips. Okay. Here we go. Avoid meetings at all costs. That's tip number one in at work tips, especially in the mornings because that's the productive time for the brain. If you must have a meeting, have it be maximum 15 minutes per meeting. According to the Tony Robbins podcast with Daniel Pink in that episode, Timing is Everything, the biggest time waster, time waster, the worst thing you can do to your team is have meetings. Because you're not just wasting. First of all, most of these meetings could be emails. Yeah, or, or most of these PowerPoints could be emails. And most one-hour meetings could have been 10 minutes. So it's not the one-hour meeting that you're just wasting because there's 40 people in that meeting. So you're literally wasting 40 hours of people's precious times and energy and willpower because you're hosting these meetings and especially in the morning when people are rested and they have mental clarity and because you're rested, these are your most high output hours of the day in which you should be tackling the most important tasks. But if you're putting meetings at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., you're just, you're just dying one hour at a time. You're just hurting your company unless again, Obviously, if it's like the most important meeting of the year or whatever, but some most of the time people just ask you, "Hey, can, uh, are you available on Thursday at nine a.m.?" And if you say yes, then they do it. But if you say no, then it doesn't get then then it's not happening at nine a.m. And then say, "Actually, I'm only available on Thursday at four p.m. Four p.m. Three p.m. is actually the best time for." Things where you don't need your high, like your most absolute, absolute concentration or 
high output moments of the brain. So the most important things where you require high output brain power in the morning and then the administrative things in the afternoon. If you've ever had a meeting with me or if you're a client with me and I send you my Calendly, which is, which is, which is another tip, you'll realize that I'm never available in the mornings because I protect it at all costs. So you can only have meetings with me from Monday to third, not even Monday, some typically like Wednesday to Thursdays from 1 to 4 p.m. Because I don't need to be like so amazing if I'm having a Zoom call or a call with somebody. But the most important things for me, like business proposals or writing comedy or or drafting ideas or journaling or even running for me is the mo- like the most important times of the day for me is the morning and I protect those hours. So avoid meetings at all costs. Tip number two at work, check email twice a day. For example, I only check my email at 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. and answer all my emails there. As opposed to opening my email 63 times a day and interrupting all my other tasks 63 times throughout the day. In other words, my friends, you're not that important. If it's an emergency, people will call. Because a lot of people in my courses, they're like, oh, no, but what if my boss, what if my boss asked me for like, send something and I got to be there. I got to answer right away. Well, no, you don't. You don't have to answer right away. Yeah, but what if it's an emergency? Well, if it was an emergency, I guarantee your boss wouldn't be just sending you an email. It would be an email and a call if it was like life or death. But it's usually, it's rarely life or death. And the other thing is, you've educated, you've accustomed your boss to the fact that you answer every email like three seconds after they write it. So now they expect it from you. And then you're one of, if you're, especially if you're one of those people who like answers at 11 p.m. or at like 6 a.m. right away. Oh no, but like my boss sent me an email at 3 a.m. or like at 10 p.m. I have to answer right away. Yeah, they send you that. Because you reply, you need to set boundaries. So you've educated and accustomed them that that you're going to reply. So that's why you've become this little Santa's helper that has to be available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But if you don't, then they're going to get used to that. And if you have the talk and they're like, "Why, why didn't you answer my email at 10 p.m.? Well, because I have a life and it's illegal and HR prohibits that. And I need to have a healthy resting time outside of work so that I can perform at my best in the hours of work. And if they complain about that, then maybe you shouldn't even be in that job. First of all, like Naval says in that uh, episode that I recommended in part one in the show notes, How to Get Rich. Nobody, like a lot of people say, no, man, I I do like 60 hour weeks. And it's like, dude, some people like 80 hour weeks, man, like nobody, a hundred hour weeks, nobody can perform. This is, this is how much, you know, that I don't work as much because I don't know how much is a law. (laughs) Okay. Let's pretend 12 hours a week times seven. Okay. Yeah. 90 hour weeks, bro. It's like, dude. Nobody can work for 90 hours a week at a high output rate. Nobody. I don't care who you are. And if you are working and you think, you're probably not performing at your best. So check your email twice a day and close your email when you're not checking it. And then you can focus on the most important tasks that your job requires And when you multiply this times seven days a week or 12 months a year, guess what? You're going to be doing more than your colleagues and that's going to earn you a promotion because you're going to be doing, you're going to be doing more output per time compared to your colleagues. So just don't multitask and prioritize. Next one, this little concept called inbox zero. Inbox zero 
is a rigorous approach to email management aimed at keeping the inbox empty or almost empty at all times. So it's basically what people, you know, people, you know, those people who have like 47,981 emails <laughs> unopened. Okay. This is for you. You need to have it at zero. And I'll tell you why inbox it's, it's not necessarily having it at zero, but I'll explain it right now. Inbox zero was developed by productivity expert Merlin Mann with a double N. And according to him, the zero is not a reference to the number of messages in an inbox, but it is the amount of time an employee's brain is in their inbox. Man's point is that time and attention are finite, which is what I've been saying this whole time. And when an inbox is confused with a to-do list, productivity suffers. So what you'll do is, oh, I have 37 emails that I have to reply. Uh, and then that 37 becomes a to-do list. And then that's taking away attention because time and attention are finite. So what should you do? The inbox zero approach recommends that you should, so that he identifies five possible actions to take for each message, for each email. And the actions are de delete, delegate it, so send it to somebody else, respond the email, defer the email, and do. So don't just leave it there and it becomes a to-do list. Literally delete it, delegate it, respond it, defer it, or do it, or do whatever the email is asking. I really like that because I've been guilty of having emails on my inbox and then it becomes a to-do list. Next one, the confirmation email. I got this from Jason Gaynard. I love this. A lot of people get really creative in meetings and they're like, oh, Stefan, could you do this and that and that and that? And they're like, fuck, man. Now I got like a million to-dos just out of this meeting and it's horrible. So the confirmation email tip goes like this. Ask your colleagues who just gave you something to do to put their request in an email. It's amazing just how powerful this technique can be because people just stop asking you for stuff and they let you work. So it goes like this. Oh, Stefan, can you actually uh, put together a PowerPoint and uh, do this, this, and that, and then that? Because... So you would say, Hey, Jason... Would you mind putting that request in an email? I really want to avoid back and forths and want to do this uh, job really, really well. And in an email, it would just allow me to do it really well, really effectively. Thank you so much, man. And then guess what Jason does? He doesn't do it because it wasn't even important in the first place. So now they, you don't have to do that thing that wasn't even important in the first place. And then they just let you work. And the worst thing is when they ask you to do something, you go do this freaking PowerPoint, you send it to them, and then they never use it. So this is just a really good filter, the confirmation email. It also happens with introductions. When people ask you for introductions for networking or other things, this is the magic question. What's the desired outcome of this connection? And a lot of times, people can't tell you. A lot of people just want you to introduce him to people, but they don't know what they want of this person. So like Simon, who I know is listening to this. <laughs> Simon was like, hey, Stefan, can you introduce me to Mario? And then I go and ask Mario if it's okay if I introduce him to Simon. And then I, I write up this incredible email. Simon, this is Mario, Mario, this is Simon. And then Simon, who requested that introduction in the first place, never follows up. So now I look like an idiot. And I wasted like two hours of my time. And it's not just two hours. It's my attention and my willpower because I had to stop doing something important. The opportunity cost of that. I had to stop doing something important to do this little introduction thing that Simon never followed up on. So the question is, you ask these people, what's the desired outcome of this connection? And most of the time they can't tell you. Next one. Tip number six, at work, speed reading. This is going to be really hard to explain just via audio, but I'll try my best. So, okay. 
the first, there's two things to read quicker, at least 20% quicker. The first one is use a pen or a pacer to help you follow what you're reading so your eyes don't zone off. It's not magic. It's just optical perception and eye mechanics. What does this mean? If I tell you to look at my nose, when you look at my nose, does that mean that you're not looking at my ear? You're looking at my nose, but you can also see my ears. Or when you look at my nose, you can also see my eyes. So just bear with me here. So when you look at a specific word that you're reading in a book, your eyesight is set on that word, but it's actually looking at the whole sentence and a bunch of other things, including the words that are on top of that word and under that word in that specific page, because your eyes are look at different, like several things at the same time. So by using a pen or a pacer, it allows you to just read what you're reading and therefore you avoid having to read back and again and, and go back. You ever been like, you ever been reading something and you're like, I don't know what I just read. Like, what did I just read? So by using that pen, you're literally just going through once and you're focusing and it, I'm telling you, you're going to read 20% quicker. And if you also use this next tip, so picture a regular page in a book. Typically, uh, any given page has 10 words in a sentence and 30, uh, 10, 10 words in a line and about 30 lines in a specific page. So the tip goes like this. Draw two vertical lines going up and down on the sides of the page. This should leave about one word out of the central section, uh, of the central perimeter. So if the sentence comes, uh, is like, uh, once upon a time, the once, you would leave it out of that central perimeter. So the line that you're drawing, the two vertical lines that you're drawing going up and down are leaving the first word out and the last word out of that. So essentially, you're now only reading inside of those two lines that are going up and down on the page. So you're only reading 80% of the words on the line because you left one word out from the beginning and the last word of that line. So you're only reading the eight words that are in the middle and you left out two words on the side of the page. But because your eyes can read... If I'm reading once upon a time, but I'm starting reading upon, my eyes, even though they're focusing on upon, it's still reading once. So by you just reading within the lines, that's a peripheral vision. That's what it's called, peripheral vision. If you're looking at my nose, peripheral vision allows you to also look at my ears at the same time. So now you're only reading 80% of the words within these two vertical lines and your peripheral vision helps you read 20% of the words that are left out of those two lines going up and down. So basically, if you combine the pacer and only reading the words inside those two lines that you drew up from the top of the page to the bottom of the page, now you're just reading 80% in and you're not foregoing the 20% of the words that are outside of that area. And I guarantee, yeah, okay. I think I explained it pretty well. Took a long time, but pretty good. Speed reading. It's going to, you're going to be able to understand. And and the, the cool thing is you're not sacrificing comprehension with this. You're reading quicker, but you're not sacrificing comprehension. So there you go. Next one, flow state. Limitless author Jim Quick recommends blocking out a two hour chunk of time with no interruptions as he says that this amount of time increases your chances of achieving flow state. Anything less than that, less than that two-hour chunk of time, you can be productive, but not as likely to achieve flow state. What is flow state? Just that time when you're just getting shit done, like, bah, 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 and you're in the zone. 
Next one, workspace. I love this one. Clean your desk, your workspace, your room at the end of the day so it's nice to come back to it. Love your workspace. It may sound unlikely, but research shows that outfitting an office with aesthetically pleasing elements like plants or pictures can increase productivity by up to 15%. So you can include plants, pictures, candles, flowers, or anything else that puts a smile on your face. And the thing is, like when I used to work at the bank, I had these friends on my floor where their desk, like you couldn't even see them on their desk because they had like like the Great Wall of China of documents and books and coffee cups. So who wants to be, who can be productive with like a billion things on their desk, literally, like diverting their attention from the task at hand. So what I do is every night I try to clean out my desk and it's just the the laptop, like the Mac, the MacBook Pro on top of my black desk. And it looks like really neat, like a Pinterest desk, you know? So now when I come back in the morning, I have that mental clarity and I can jump right into the next task at hand. Next one, huge delegate. And if no one on your team can do the task that you're trying to delegate, well, there's this little website called Upwork and or Fiber. Upwork.com, just like it sounds. Uh, Upwork, like up and work.com. And Fiber, it's like five, the number five. F-I-V-E and double R. Fiverr. For amazing freelance services. I've done a lot of things there. You can do flyers for events. So there's amazing graphic designers. The core values and and the core beliefs for My Pensando and Rethink, we hired a copywriter there as well. Uh, If you need incredible PowerPoint presentations, I can recommend you to, to a friend. Her name is Amira. She actually did the... She's Egyptian. And these people are, this is like Uber, but for services. So Amira did our PowerPoint, my PowerPoint for the Productivity Machine Workshop. And she is in Egypt, but she's amazing at this. And it's like Uber where you can see the reviews. You can see how much money they've made. You can see how many services they've uh, given. You see their rating as well, like 100% or five stars. You can see their, you can see their past jobs too. Um, who else have I? Oh, translation services, Spanish to English websites. It's, it's just so easy to use. And because you're delegating it and you, then you can do the things that you do best. So for example, I always give this example. I, <laughs> I love graphic design, but I'm not good at it because I never learned it. So like a couple years ago in like 2018, I tried to learn it and because Juan does, my business partner does all the graphic design for, for my Pensando or a comedy club and everything that we do. So I'm like, man, I'm, uh, Juan is like swamped. I, I'd like to help. So I went on Coursera and I try, I, I joined this graphic design course. And after like six months, all I could do basically was like, I could crop a picture <laughs> on Photoshop. So like six months of classes and time and work to just be able to do nothing Clearly, I wasn't born for it, you know? But if I pay someone $20 or $60 on Upwork, that could free up my time. Like, my, they could free me up six months of my time. Imagine. And the cool thing is they could do, like, a million times better because this is what, what they do for a living. So delegating is, like, the eighth wonder of the world. I can't, I can't. And then you you look and appear to others, especially decision makers or people who you want to impress, like you're doing amazing things, let alone the fact that you're empowering others and you're not micromanaging them. Because if you're delegating, then that means that you trust them. So that means that they these people feel seen and heard if they're on your team, obviously, and you're, you're giving them trust and then everybody's better off. Also, like we said in session one, in part one. Done is better than perfect. So let's execute, my friends. Next one, take advantage of your commute. These ones are quicker. Commute. If you're in the car, listen to audiobooks. 
or have a call with clients or call your mom. That's also productive. Call your parents. Call your grandparents. Or if you're on the subway, read a book or meditate. I used to meditate so much on the subway. Then WhatsApp. Uh, 11, tip number 11 of this one at work. Download WhatsApp on your computer because you can, like, if I can type faster on my computer than I can do it on my thumbs on the cell phone. So, again, if you think about this long term, how many hours am I saving a year? Probably like 20, probably like 10 hours a year I'm saving just by using WhatsApp on my computer than by using it on my cell phone. Next one, use templates in Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook, and others. There's always emails that we use at work that have the same format, the same structure because we send them every day or every week. But you but you type them up every week, which is useless. It's such a waste of time. In Gmail, in settings at the top or Hotmail or Outlook, you can have templates. So when you do compo- when you do um yeah, compo- compose email, write an email, new email, you go on the templates uh, option and then boom your email appears and then you just have to change the name and attach whatever you want to attach and then you're golden and that my friends some people send like 4,000 emails a year that are the same structure and they're typing them every morning so imagine if you could save 5 minutes times 4,000 per email that's 20,000 minutes a year 20,000 minutes a year, let's see, 20,000 minutes a year, divided by 60, that is 333 hours that you're saving, so there you go, mixmax.com, tip number 13, this is a little website that lets you find out when somebody read your email, how many times they read your email, from what city they read your email, at what time, and on which device, on their cell phone, on their iPad. And it is super, super good for context when making, when doing follow-ups, when following up with people. And it's free. Literally, mixmax.com. And it's like a little pixel, I think. I don't know what it's called, but like um, it's in embedded within your email. So when people open it, it shows you on your on your on your own email if they open it at what time from where what device how many times so now you know oh man these people have been looking at my email many 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 times and it's really good for the tonality that your follow up will have next one hunter.io it's this little website that is also going to save you time and maybe it's going to open like a billion opportunities because Hunter.io allows you to find out someone's work email just by knowing their name and the company they work for. So basically, if you know a decision maker works at this place or you would like to uh, apply for a job at Scotiabank Investment Banking because in Colombia you used to do investment banking and you know they have it at Scotiabank. And you know the guy's name is Mario Perez. And you know Mario Perez works at Scotiabank. Then you go on hunter.io and you type in Scotiabank. And it tells you the format that the company Scotiabank works for email. So it would tell you like, oh, okay, Scotiabank has uses this format. First name dot last name at scotiabank.com. So now you know that Mario Perez's email at Scotiabank is mario.perez at scotiabank.com. And this could save you hours. In fact, it could, it could make, you, make you make like thousands of dollars a year just by being able to access the decision maker directly. Hunter.io. And by I-O, I mean like, yeah, the letter I and the letter O. Not com, not dot com, just hunter.io. 15, my favorite tip in the world. This has probably saved me a thousand hours over the past two years. Calendly. Like a calendar, but Calendly with a Y in the end. And I use Calendly to schedule meetings and calls and avoid unnecessary back and forth. 
So basically, I would screen share, but so I'll use an example. If typically when you have clients, like uh, I have a client, her name is uh, Andrea. And Andrea's like, oh, sometimes you're even writing, like you're trying to schedule a call via email. So, oh yeah, we should we should get together to discuss this project. And so I'm like, Maria, can you, when can, I email her, when can you get, when can you meet for, to discuss this? She's like, two days later, she's like, oh, next Monday at, at 9 a.m. A day later, I'm like, I can't do that. Can you do uh, Thursday at 4 p.m.? She's like, no, two days later, no, I can only do Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and next Friday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then two days later, I reply, actually, I can't do those days. Blah, 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 blah. And then it's like days to be able to just set up a freaking call. So Calendly is basically a link that you send to this person that they click. And when they click it, they see your the availabilities that you've picked in certain times of the week and the cool thing is that they pick that 15 minute slot or one hour slot you can pick how long is the meeting and then the cool thing about calendly is that it connects it integrates with zoom so automatically calendly once they confirm that slot that time because that's the only times that i can do so now she has my entire calendar availability for the next year she clicks on like tuesday at 2 15 p.m says yes 15 minute meeting confirm what's my email and then when she clicks confirm it automatically gives her and me a zoom link to have the call so now we don't have to discuss when we're meeting why we're meeting where we're meeting, what time, it's on Zoom at this time that you said you were available because you saw my schedule. And now we don't have to have like a billion back and forth in email. And it's just been like the best thing. I use this to schedule my podcast episodes, to schedule my one-on-one, my, my one-on-one um, speaking, coaching clients, 15-minute calls with clients, everything. The next one is Evernote. Download Evernote and you can have shortcuts you can have notebooks. It's like a, it's like soup. Evernote is a really, really good way to have notes and to have notebooks. And the cool thing is every note has tags. Notes on iPhone is really confusing and it doesn't, uh, maybe I think it's improved recently, but Evernote is really cool. Also, the notes are shareable. So I could have a note and I could share it with my wife or with Huang or with whoever. And I have a bunch of no I have a bunch of notes and notebooks on Evernote. So for example, I have on my shortcuts I have links that I always use, comedy bits, I have another note called books to read, apps to get, videos to watch, courses to take, ideas for my pensando, important docs, there I have my license, my banking information, my 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 healthcare. I have bios that that we have for Malpensando, for me, Huang, uh, all the stuff from not, not Working to Networking. I used to have all my podcast stuff there, but now I have it on Notion, which is another free app. I also have really cool quotes and negotiation tips. And then I have like notebooks where I, and in these notebooks, I have all the notes. So these notebooks are called, uh, Malpensando, personal, personal development, Stefan Dyer comedy, stand up comedy bits, Toastmasters, and podcast. So there's really cool, really, really cool tutorials on YouTube of Evernote. But on the topic of Evernote, now I use Notion for lots of things because Notion is like Evernote on steroids. Evernote is really cool, good to take notes, but Notion is just on another level. And it has a bunch of templates too for journaling, for goal setting, for marketing, for CRMs, for clients, for sales, for trips, 
for planning your trip. Like, it's just, like, incredible. And it's also, like, a database. Um, yeah, so, I, yeah, Notion is incredible for all your company organizational needs as well. Tip number 18, and the second last tip is Canva. Very simple. Canva is basically graphic design for dummies. You can do flyers, like a million things, Temp like little video templates for Instagram stories. It looks so professional and it's free. If you want the paid version, then you can pay $16 a month, which I do. And if you've seen all my podcast flyers, I don't need a graphic designer because I did everything on Canva, except the lettering, which Maria Science and, and Maureen... Uh, and Maureen Shambach did, and the graphic design, like the cropping that Carlos Bolivar, who edits this podcast, does. But Canva has like hundreds of thousands of templates and pictures and things that you can do for graphic design. And you could you could organize like you could you could you could design a birthday party, a baptism flyer, and they look so professional. And it's free. And then the last one is Link Tree. Linktree, it's easier if you see it. So go on my Instagram profile, at Stefan Dyer, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-D-Y-E-R, like the name of this podcast. <laughs> and in my bio, you'll see a link, and it literally says link, let me see, it says, uh, in the in the bio, it says, linktr.ee so linktree but with a dot before the two e's uh then it says uh how do you say this in english diagonal i just forgot how to say diagonal dash no it's not dash anyways linktr.ee forward whatever at uh, and stefan dyer and in that you have several links in, within a link. So within that link, within this link tree, which is also free, by the way, and you can customize the color and the pictures and everything, I have several buttons that lead to different links that I always use. For example, buy tickets to my next comedy show, not working to networking season five, public speaking through comedy course. If you click on the next one, it says one-on-one -on -one speaking coaching discovery call. Book a corporate event discovery call, the link to the Stefan Dyer podcast on Spotify, and the link to the Stefan Dyer podcast on YouTube. So sometimes you you always have these links that you send to people, but you're sending like a billion links every day. But if you only had if you had the the like the billion links on the link tree, you just have to send the one link every day to everybody. And the cool thing is that they get to see other things that you do because within that series of links, they'll like they, they were looking for the comedy show, but then they'll see that you do productivity coaching or that you do relationships coaching or that you do uh, marathon coaching like my cousin who's going to be on this podcast soon. So link tree is the last tip my friends oh my god this is ridiculous we did and just over an hour 20 but an hour 20 to say like a thousand hours over the next five years this is ridiculous you're you're this is really good and kudos to you because you're investing in your yourself okay so last thing i'm gonna say book documentary and podcast recommendations i'll try to put these in the show notes but i'll say them and then we're gonna close First, the Productivity Planner, which is a little book that I use. If you're seeing the video on Spotify, it's this little agenda journal planner that I use for the past three years to plan my week. I don't change it for nothing. It's by Intelligent Change. You can buy it at intelligentchange.com. And the next book journal that I use is the 5-Minute Journal by the same company, and it's a gratitude journal. And I fill it out in the morning and at night, and it just makes me feel better about my life, what I do, through a deep sense of gratitude. If you're really good 
with these two planners and you have a really solid um, routine in terms of planning your week and your gratitude and you want to really double down on planning your goals for next year, there's this agenda that I used for three years. I didn't use it this year because I did it by myself, but it helps you track your habits and your goals and your monthly goals and everything. And it's called Living Your Best Year Ever by Darren Hardy. The next book is called The One Thing that I recommended a bunch of times by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Just type The One Thing on Amazon. You'll get it. Next book is The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, one of my favorite podcasters and productivity gurus. The 4-Hour Work Week, just genius. Then the following ones are three documentaries on Netflix. Cheesy, but go watch it. It's it's really good. It's it's minimalistic. The Marie Kondo series on Netflix and the minimalism documentaries on Netflix. One is called the first, watch the first one first, the one in 2017. It's called Minimalism, a documentary about important things, about the important things. And the one from last year called The Minimalists, Less is Now. Then there's this video by my friends uh, Diego Hidalgo and Danny Gomez. They had this little, uh, this blog called The Disruptive Conse- Consensus on YouTube. And there's this really cool video on productivity that they did. And last but not least, the Tony Robbins podcast episode with Daniel Pink called Timing is Everything. Game changer. I think it's only 40 minutes. Game changer, my friends. So I'll try to put these show notes as thorough as possible. I'm so happy we got to do this. My back is killing me. I already got like some really cool messages of people who listened to the part one and are excited to listen to part two. I actually got someone who wanted a one-on-one productivity coaching, which I don't do as much anymore, but if there's people interested, let me know. And we've come to the end, my friends. An hour and a half of killer productivity tips. I hope you... I've been wanting to do this for a long time. As you know, this is a thing that I'm really passionate about. And I hope that you saw a lot of value in this. If you liked it, recommend it to some of your friends. Like, recommend it to some of your colleagues. And I'll see you at my next comedy show, workshop, or keynote speech. More information at stephandire.com or malpensando.com ladies and gentlemen from everybody at the Stephen Dyer podcast (laughs) I'm talking like we have a billion people my wife is the producer who started this whole thing with me I've actually kind of automated all the tasks so she doesn't have to (laughs) do much anymore but she's still the producer and the great Carlos Bolivar who edits this podcast and myself yours truly Big hug y hasta la próxima. Stefan Dyer y Stefan Dyer on the Stefan Dyer Podcast. Ciao, ciao. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer Podcast. Arrivederci, my people.